Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this day. Uh, we ask you now that you would bring clarity to your word now. Lord, I, I pray that you'd help me believe it. Pray also that you would remove distractions. We pray against the enemy in this place that tries to distract us at all times. We offer this time for you, Lord, for your glory, for our joy. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It looks like we got some competition downstairs today. I have to work on my volume levels here. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Casey out here for wrangling kids in the middle of service. It's hard sometimes to have to be relegated sometimes in the back. She's looking at me through the corner there. <laughs> so thank you for working with the kids every week, week in and week out. We love you mothers. I know it's not Mother's Day, but we love them. So here we are in the second week of Lent, and we are cruising through. How are your disciplines going? Don't have to answer that out loud. How's Lent for you? And one of the things I'd like to reflect a little bit on in the beginning here is about the word commitment. Is it a four-letter word nowadays? Maybe it is. I think it's one of the things that is on an all-time low. Our human condition lends itself toward non-committal relationships. Marriage is at an all-time low, even in Christian communities. Average job tenure, if I put out a survey, I'm sure I'd get different answers. How long do you think people stay in a given job these days? I know COVID has put pressure on this. 1.8 years. 1.8 years. Of course, as you get older, the it gets longer and longer. Um, I'm not going to refer to all the numbers there. 1.8 years. Any sports fans here? Uh, if you watch a lot of sports, how often are you seeing somebody stay their entire career on one team in a month? Kobe Bryant, come on. Anybody? Uh, Clayton Kershaw, Dodger, been with the Dodgers his entire career. Just re signed this past week. The, the lockout, you know, all those issues with baseball are finally done. Thank you, Lord. I'm a baseball fan. I'm sorry, I'm showing you my cards here. Um, sports, people just jump and ship for money. Commitment forms the fabric of our society. One of the forms of commitment today that forms this fabric, as you guys all know, is marriage. Marriage forms the foundation of a family, and healthy families form the foundation of society. And society forms the foundation of the whole world. You can see that commitment between two people can affect the entire world. Isn't that crazy? So I was, uh, I got married to my beloved bride almost 10 years ago. And it wasn't always easy. And I know you guys can probably give me some stories too, but what, marriage is a challenge. The commitment is a challenge. But we do commit ourselves to each other. And one of the things, and, I, and I'm, when I'm talking about marriage, I'm also insisting that covenant relationships can do the same thing for us. For those of you that aren't married in this room. Um, but for marriage, I can speak to that now. I feel like after 10 years, I can finally preach a little bit about marriage. You know, I get a decade in, I can finally say something a little bit from Scripture, a little bit authoritatively from my experience. Um, but when your marriage is good, you go out in strength. When your marriage is a challenge and struggling, you go out in weakness. So every area of your life, when those fundamental relationships, when that marriage covenant is strong, all of your other areas, you can handle a lot of onslaught, can't you? Your job can be horrible. But if you got a strong marriage relationship, you can stay the course. 
But if you have a horrible job situation and you got stuff at home happening, it's a challenge. It's hard. Parenting is a lot easier when your marriage is going pretty good. Can I get an amen from anybody out there? <laughs> Work, a lot easier. Neighbors, you know, when your marriage is good, you're more likely to invite neighbors into that situation. When your marriage is not working out, that's the last thing you want to do is invite neighbors in. Ministry, speaking for myself. The truth, of course, that lies behind marriage is covenant making or our promise making God. If you think about heaven, just briefly, all of our relationships in heaven will be permanent. Unwavering, unshifting, unchanging. And this is why covenant relationships in marriage is a sacrament of that permanence. Permanent rock. And so then, covenant relationships form some of the systems that this blessing can come to earth. Heaven can come to earth. The fundamental bedrock of our long-term health and life of the world around us is the truth that our God is a God who makes covenants to humanity. He commits to us warts and all. <clears throat> and that forms the foundation of mission, healing, love, wholeness, etc., etc., etc. But this commitment of God to us forms the foundation of everything. So today we're going to see, we're going to jump into Genesis 15. We're going to see one of the earliest covenants ever made with God and humanity. So if you want to open up your Bible to Genesis 15 with me, there's a little bit of weird stuff going on if you read it. Maybe you didn't understand it the first time you read it. I'm going to try to pick a little bit of a part, a part for you today. And Genesis 15, of course, is God's covenant with Abram. He's not yet Abraham until he gets the covenant of circumcision two chapters later. God changes his name. His wife's name is Sarai, which changes to Sarah also at the same time. But I'm going to refer to him as Abraham because I'm going in between all that. So just know that he's not yet Abraham, but in that situation. So in Genesis 12, in response to this crescendo of sin in the world, leading up to the Tower of Babel, what does God do? He calls Abraham from his family to go to a strange land. Abraham, and in verse 12, 1, I think it says there, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. That must have been a challenge for God to call Abraham away from something familiar and maybe comfortable. And God calls us to go as well. Maybe you sense some of the call from God. And it might not always be to leave something familiar, but the call for God is to leave disobedience and work towards obedience to our Lord. And as you guys know, that gets weird. Anybody walking with Jesus and all of a sudden you're tending to scripture and you, oh, you want me to do what? And I think about this. And I think about the call of Noah. I mean, thought about this for a moment. You guys know Noah built the ark. This is one of the most famous kids' stories in all the world. Imagine Noah building a humongous boat in the middle of the desert. What people would have thought about him? Hey, uh, what are you doing? I'm just building a boat in the middle of the desert. That's kind of weird. But Noah had heard from God that God told him to build this boat. And he, by faith, followed that call from the Lord. Similarly, Jeremiah, and this is a prophet of the Old Testament, in the middle of this siege, it's kind of like if you think of this modern day, I don't want to, like Ukraine, how Russia's sieging all these different areas of Ukraine. The city of Jerusalem was sieged at one point, and the prophet Jeremiah is declaring people to repent and turn from their sins. And God tells Jeremiah to buy a plot of land in Jerusalem. So people are all scared, running to and fro, and Jeremiah's working out paperwork to buy the land. 
up in, what are you doing? Well, God told me to buy a plot of land. What? What are you doing, Jeremiah? What's going on here? And then further on in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, of course, God's called him in a powerful way. And there's one point in the book of Acts on one of his missionary journeys, he comes to a city called Lystra. And the way that I remember it is that in seminary, remember, he was laid out in Lystra. So it was one of these things that I try to remember is he got stoned. And I'm not talking about 420, you know. He didn't go and smoke, and then he got stones thrown at him, left for dead. He didn't die, of course. He got up and said, I think I'm going to go to a different town. <laughs> he keeps on going and sharing the gospel. And then... He goes through this journey up into Turkey, northern, and he's towards the east, and he says, I think I'm going to go back to the same place I went to strengthen the believers there. What, what did you say? You just got stoned in Lystra, and now he's going to go right back through. Talk about the call of God on our lives. It gets awkward. And challenging. And I was thinking about it this week as uh, Monday, many of you guys know I went around knocking on doors to invite people to Alpha by myself. Generally, I don't go by myself because it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to lose my courage. You go out excited, you're walking around and somebody slams the door on you, starts saying no, um, you interact with something and you feel like you're on the front line. But this time, God, for whatever reason, kept me encouraged the entire time. And I was going door to door. I knocked on about 30 or so doors over there. And God appointed a man to give me an encouraging word. I went. There was a man washing his car. I think I told Eric this story. I walked up to him. And I said, hey, I, you know, I had a flyer. Hey, just, just so you know, we're having a dinner over here. I'd love for you guys to come out, for you to come out. And I said something about washing cars, you know, to try to make small talk. And after he took the car, he just looked at me and said, you're doing a great job. And for me, that was God's hand extending to my heart and just blessing me. And it got me another hour of energy to keep going. Just that one word of encouragement. But to knock on doors is awkward. It's weird. But the call of God often produces weird, awkward situations. It can create awkwardness in your family of origin. What are you doing, son or daughter so-and-so? What's going on here? What? Okay, family of origin at work. Has it ever been awkward at work for you to have, be a Christian? Yeah, it gets kind of awkward. Your friends, maybe you have some old friends who aren't Christians anymore. The call of God can produce challenging situations. Is God calling you? Have you embraced obedience for his sake? And have others taken note? The call for Abraham was to leave what was comfortable and familiar for the sake of God's cosmic plan in the world and in his life. And God calls each and every one of us because he loves us and wants what's best for us. And what's best for us is to frog, fully rely on God, right? <laughs> fully rely on God. God's going to take you out and put you in situations where you're going to have to fully rely on him. To frog. And this produces a cry. So we're going to read verses 1 through 8 here in 15. That's what I'm talking about. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. 
And he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He just couldn't get it, did he? He asked him three or four times. God's like, look, look at the stars. I'm going to give you a sun. I'm going to give you the land. But I need some concrete proof. Now, this is the call. God initiates a relationship with us. And he calls us into situations where we have to trust him. And that produces a cry. If we're honest, honesty produces that foundation where God can act. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Lord, what are you talking about? I'm not seeing this promise come to fruition. God, what are you going to do? What have you been crying lately? Speaking to myself here. What are you afraid of when you set out to follow Jesus more closely? What are you unwilling to give up to embrace this call? So we look, if we peel it back just a little bit, a, an heir, a child at this time for Abraham was like a bank account. It would have been long-term generational wealth to build a family, to have farm hands, to pass on the, his wealth and all of those things and so without a son there was no hope he was hopeless so for him his son was the security this is abraham's security that he's talking about jesus how do i know god how do i know you're going to provide for me <clears throat> and that we need to ask ourselves this very question we put our Selves in Abraham's shoes. What or whom are we looking to for security? And you guys know there's all kinds of systems around security anxiety. There's insurance for life, insurance for you know cars, insurance for the home, for cell phones. There's insurance for insurance. I think. <laughs> I mean, there's you can get insurance for everything. Security is one of our greatest anxieties today. Of course, coming out of COVID, right? Fear of and anxiety of security. If we have embraced the call of God, we will experience doubt and fear and anxiety. But we don't have to stop there. We can take the anxiety and the fear and turn it into a petition and offer it to God. And then, after we've offered it to God, we wait to see how he's going to respond in the situation. Faith with doubt is normal. Let me say that today. Faith with doubt is normal. It's part of what faith means. We can't see it. We're going to doubt it. Well, God responds to Abraham in verse 9. Continuing here, he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete." When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land. 
from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. You guys understand that? I can just end the sermon now, right? <laughs> what is going on, right? Well, in this, in this situation, God responds to Abraham's lamentation, his cry, by initiating a covenantal ceremony. He's a covenant-making God. He commits to Abram here in this situation. But this isn't something that we normally do today. We don't have heifers and, you know, all that stuff. So the basic understanding here, and this is a sort of a form of a covenant treaty or a, um, a promise that the king of the area would come and make with a people in a particular location. So normally what would happen if a king, there was turnover, maybe the father now died and a son is beginning to reign, or a particular king came and conquered a location, he would set up a ceremonial situation where they would understand what the king desires and what the people can offer. And so they come together and discuss the content of the promise of the covenant and the way that they would do it is they would they would discuss it and they say okay we agree to that well let's make it formal so the way they would do it is they would take animals cut them in half separate them on each sides and the two parties would walk through the middle of the animals and that would signify the commitment on both parties and what it would say is if i don't live up to my end of the bargain let me be like these animals cut in two so it's ratifying a covenant between two parties in this situation. But if we look in verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passes between the pieces. So who passed between the pieces? It's just a representation of God here. Abraham's back having a little siesta. He's napping. He didn't quite make it. And God is saying, I'm making a commitment to you. And the requirements of it fall solely on me to fulfill. I will take the weight of this covenant for you. And I'm trying to think of a, a contemporary example of this. So imagine somebody comes and buys a mansion next to the beach he draws out all the paperwork and you just take a nap okay? and you wake up and he says okay I've purchased this mansion for you I paid for it I did all the paperwork it's based on my credit history I've paid it off all the way and here's the deed I'm just gonna give it to you and so, next thing you know, you have the deed to a humongous mansion next to the beach. You don't have, you're not in the house yet, to make it clear. But it's been purchased, paid for, and you, you have it as a gift to you. That's going to change your life a little bit. The struggle for us, when we see this covenant thing, whatever's happening in there is to walk in confidence that God's going to provide every single thing that I need. God's going to do it. This is what he promises. So what would your life look like if you had zero anxiety about provision, finances, or anything else? Would your life change if you truly believed this, <laughs> I think it would. It's going to take some effort to believe that. It's going to take some work to believe that. And I think God wanted Abraham to know that he wanted to provide every ounce of what he needed from beginning to end. And not only that, as you guys know, God fulfilled this covenant in the person of Jesus on the cross. Because there's one thing that we cannot provide, that's forgiveness of sins and righteousness through his son, Jesus. And so God took on this covenant in the person of Jesus, 
And on the cross, Jesus was laid out, cut in two, if you will, fulfilling his side of the covenant. And we can believe in God's provision fully in the person of Jesus. And this is salvation, believing in the promises of God. That's it. It's, we don't have to make it much harder than that. Daily relying on God's promises. The call for you and me is to take God's promises and walk our lives out as if they are true. My prayer for us is that we can do that in Lent, so that we can reorient away from the things that take our devotion and unto Him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us stand together and respond in faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. Confessing together, we believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, right from right, true God from true God, begotten not made, O one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord of the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll continue the prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy. For Foley Beach, our Archbishop, and Keith Andrews, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Joe Biden, our president, and Gavin Newsom, our governor, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, Lord, in your mercy. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Grant, O oh Lord, we pray that as we seek direction for our prayer's future, we may find the search leads us to yourself. Give us courage to seek honestly and reverence to seek humbly. And when our minds are perplexed and we see no clear direction, give us patience to go on with our daily duties and faithful worship. Lord, in your
your mercy. Hear our prayer. Feel free to add your petitions in your sight of me forever. Lord, we pray for Luis and Wesley and Pedro, friends who we met this week, and for all the visitors of Alpha, Lord, that you draw them to yourself, and that we would be a, a sweet aroma of Christ to them. Lord, in your mercy. Here we lift up uh, Brother Sean and uh, just ask for your influence and power in their lives and our eyes. Thank you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. I pray for your church and things in life in Ukraine and Syria and other places where life is very, very difficult. Pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would grant them courage, grant them trust in you, and fill them with your spirit that may serve those around them. Glory and mercy. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, the only mediator and advocate who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Amen. Please share God's peace in this time. Peace be with you. Side hug you. Oh, peace be with you. Peace. All right. Good to see you. Good morning. We want five. I slept in. Zoom back. And that's what we're gonna do. Peace be with you, young fella. Good. How you doing? As usual, I do it myself. You want to do your own work? All right. Peace. service I think today in celebration of some birthdays. The chocolate cake from Costco. I hope I didn't let the bag cat out of the bag. The bag out of the cat.
They'll say our offertory sentence will begin a time of offering.